locomotion of animals and robots, uh, and that's the title in non-living, living and non-living locomoting systems. Uh, and I'll also mention something about dimensionality reduction, which allows us to actually make use of this stuff. Okay, so uh, my group, oh yes, and by the way, it also has relationship to these sort of interesting uh, phenomena, including zero angular momentum turns in cats, how you can parallel park your car, uh, and why a Foucault pendulum uh, processes as the day goes around. The folks uh, on this slide are the folks who've done the work, and one of them is in fact in the room, uh, Nick Gravish, who was a PhD student of mine, whose talk I missed this morning, but I'm sure it was fantastic. Uh, and it's a mixture of physicists, biologists, engineers, um, control theorists, and uh, I'll try to highlight various people uh, as I move along. Um, okay, so uh, the previous talk was a perfect setup uh, for my talk um, because uh, I'm, my group is fascinated by questions of locomotion. We haven't studied the kind of hydrodynamic locomotion as uh, typified by this beautiful eel swimming. Um, and again, as we just saw in the previous talk, uh, in principle, this seems simple. You wiggle your body and you push against the fluid. The fluid pushes against you and you propel yourself forward. Of course, there's nothing simple about this. Uh, and these animals do it with capabilities far exceeding our current robots, even our current swimming robots. Um, we also could talk about aerodynamic self-propulsion. I'm not sure if maybe Nick talked about some aerodynamic this morning. No, but I like showing this video, one, because I get to use the word aerodynamic for what's coming next. But two, I and my, at the time, four-year-old daughter captured this video on my smartphone uh, one day in Atlanta. Uh, it's a carpenter bee. They're an infestation in certain times of the year. And it's a video at 200 frames a second. And if you had told me 10 years ago that I could go out in the field and take a high-speed video, I would just blow my mind. Anyway, you could do all this incredible, really cool biomechanics, uh, which is my kind of core interest um, now for essentially almost zero dollars. The problems that are of most interest and fascination in my group, though, are what we now call paradynamic self-propulsion. Uh, problems. Terra, aero, hydro, terra. Uh, movement on terra firma or not so firma. And this is typified, I like showing this video, some of you might have seen this video. Uh, it gives you a sort of sense of not only the mechanics that organisms that live in seemingly terra firma, like uh, sand and, and dry deserts, uh, but sort of a sense of the ecology as well. And I'll just let this video play. Uh, so here's a sidewinder. Uh, my group has studied sidewinders along with David Hu uh, to some extent. And this sidewinder in this case is actually trying to go after some prey. And the prey is a little lizard. And the little lizard uh, manages to use the feature of this granular material, this collection of par particles, by going from a solid where it can run on the surface and turning it into a fluid and squirting beneath. The lizard is really fast. The snake can also use the properties of the granular material in a rather beautiful dynamics by which it shovels itself in, in a way we still don't understand, by the way, and we've tried to understand this. Uh, just putting its head underneath, poking through uh, a little bit, and then doing a little trick where it puts its tail up in, out of the sand. Why, you might ask? Well, the claim is that little invertebrates, which also has inhabit dry deserts, think these things are plant matter. So the ant goes for the tail, <laughs> the lizard goes for the ant, and the snake goes for the lizard, and so you get a circle of life and death. Anyway, so there's a whole richness in these seemingly very boring, barren uh, environments, which are somewhere between fluid and solids. Okay, so I, because I've got an hour, I figured, and because this is a broad workshop, I figured I would give you my kind of five minutes of philosophy on how I, as a physicist who's moved into biomechanics for the last 15 years, kind of think of these problems and why I think they're actually physics problems for the 21st century. So motion uh, played a very important role in early physics and biology. No one would doubt that, and I like showing this picture when I'm in Italy, of course. Uh, Galileo, of course, taught us, and Newton followed, that motion is pretty simple. Motion happens when nothing is to prevent it. Uh, and continues forever and ever and ever, and can be, objects can be changed from their state of motion by external forces like gravitating bodies. Um, and in fact, the reason I call it De Motu is because after he died, he published a book, De Motu Antiquoria. Now, the other person whose 
not as well known, at least to physicists, certainly to some physiologists, is a guy named Borelli, who was a contemporary, more or less, of Galileo. He wrote a book called De Motu Animalium. And uh, it turns out that he wrote, <laughs> he was studying the far more complicated problems in motion than what Galileo was studying. The little lizard fish and uh, bee that you saw in the previous slides are not being pulled across the ground by a mysterious force. They are generating shape changes in their body, which are appropriately coupling to environment, which is allowing them to move from A to B. It's a subtle shift, but it's one that causes tremendous difficulty in trying to develop a framework similar to the framework that's been developed to understand planetary body dynamics. Um, of course, the center of mass is due to internal forces contracting muscles, as the previous speaker uh, nicely showed, or contracting motors in the case of robots. OK, well, this is simple. Oh, by the way, instead of calling things locomotion, I'm going to call them self-propulsion when things are moving from A to B through the world. That's a technical point, but it'll become clear why I'm doing that in a minute. Uh, how easy is it to predict self-propulsion? Well, here's a video from a former postdoc of mine who did this work when he was a PhD student at Brown University. And it's a frog jumping. And you might say, well, if I want to understand how far a frog jumps, I simply measure the ground reaction forces. And I can integrate. And that should tell me how the center of mass moves, a la Galileo. However, what you really may want to do is you may want to be able, you may want to decompose this frog into all its constituent parts. You may want to reduce this thing into the fundamental parts that make it up. And then you might want to basically go and say, well, how does the nervous system couple to the musculoskeletal system, ultimately coupling to the ground, to create a jump of 50, 20 centimeters, however much it is? The question is, can we do this? Can we predict such a simple dynamics from such a reduction. How well, the counterpoint to that, how well do the parts have to work together for useful movement to emerge? This is, in fact, a question which is sort of driving a whole lot of our current research, which I'm not going to talk to you about today. Well, we have a good example. And because this is a, this is a, a, a conference on robots and animals, I figured I would show you some of the best robots in the world and just how well we can do uh, by such a reduction. And the answer is pretty poorly. So this is from a few years back. And I'm cherry picking this. Most of you have seen this. This was a DARPA robotics challenge. And the idea was to create robots that could work along with first responders, be able to go into nasty environments, walk through open doors, uh, go in hazardous environments. The cool thing, the thing I like about this, the robots have gotten a little better in the last few years, you've probably seen the Boston Dynamics videos. Don't believe everything you see. I know those guys well. Uh, but they are better now for certain reasons, uh, but not that much better. And in fact, this is the blooper reel of failures. But if I showed you the reel of successes, you would laugh just as hard, because the successes, and the successes still, are of, of not a lifelike quality. There's not a fluidity and a robustness. Uh, and the, the thing that I find so philosophically interesting in this, and again, to this reductionist idea, is that the engineers are really good engineers who make these things. Millions of dollars were spent, uh, some by individual groups. They know every part. Every part is specced to beautiful tolerance. They know every line of code. And these problems of opening doors are challenging, tricky, et cetera, et cetera. And OK, so you might say, well, that's unfair. Those are humanoid robots that have to balance and open doors. What about a little closer to down to Earth? Well, here's my friend and colleague's robot. It's, he would claim, the premier snake robot in the world. Why do you want a snake robot? You may want to go in nasty environments like caves and, and disaster sites and squirm through in the rubble and look for people. And this is a robot, which is supposed to be a snake, trying to get through an environment which basically most snakes on the planet inhabit, which is kind of grassy leaf litter stuff and failing miserably. Why? Well, again, we know all the motors. There's even some sensing in there. There's feedback that can happen. The principles aren't there. Uh, and finally, here's one where you might say, well, <laughs> let's at least put legs on the thing so that we have some idea, reduce the degrees of freedom a little bit from 24 to you know, 6, 2 times 3. Uh, and here we run into problems because we don't have a good understanding largely of the kind of interaction physics in the Mojave Desert in the US, for example, when the robot's legs are going to slip and slide. And so this is a real, it's a real mess. Uh, and I think that there's a new approach needed. That's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, 
But first, I want to say, what can robots teach us about living systems? I figured a little bit of philosophy was warranted in a talk like this. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, the more I read it over the years, the, the better I like it. It's from a guy named Pierce, John Pierce, who was kind of one of the early, uh, I don't know about founders, but one of the early proselytizers of information theory, a contemporary Shannon. And he says, I will, however, maintain that we can learn at least two things from the history of science. One is, these, is that many of the most general and powerful discoveries of science have risen not through the study of phenomena as they occur in nature, but rather through the study of phenomena in man-made devices, in products of technology, if you will. This is because the phenomena in man's machines, humans' machines, are simplified and ordered in comparison with those occurring naturally. And it is these simplified phenomena that man understands most easily. Thus, the existence of the steam engine in which the phenomena involving heat, pressure, vaporization, condensation occurred in a simple and orderly fashion gave tremendous impetus to the very powerful and general science of thermodynamics. We see this especially in the work of Carnot. And I like this part. Our knowledge of aerodynamics and hydrodynamics exists chiefly because airplanes and ships exist, not because of the existence of birds and fishes. Now, that's what he thought in the 50s. I think that's actually probably changed in some of the work that Nick and my colleague Simon Sponberg are doing to try to understand flapping flight, actually probably pushing some new hydrodynamics, but that was the idea. Uh, of course, Norbert Wiener in the 30s, 40s, and 50s was thinking about these very same things. It's just that I think that the field of cybernetics was essentially largely theory driven and the technology wasn't there yet to really begin to look for common principles and control of communication of animal and machine. And finally, I am a physicist, so I'm obligated to put a quote from Feynman up when I give a talk and that quote will be what I can't not create, I can't understand. And I think that you'll see some of the ways we're making robots really force us to understand things we didn't think we needed to even understand. So in fact, this is what we sort of think. This will be my last little bit of philosophy here. We think there's really a need for kind of a physics of robotics. As Massimo once told me, boy, it's sort of like you're giving robotics the physics treatment. Uh, it turns out that studying the emergent aspects of robot and animal locomotion, emergent in the sense that you know I've got a lot of parts and how do these things organize to, to go from A to B, as the previous speaker pointed out, it can be a real challenge in organisms. And it turns out it can be just as much of a challenge in robots, which I've learned. Uh, robots have been expensive, hard to make flexible, hard to add sensors. Focus has been on control theory. Most robotics are really demonstrations of control principles and very mathematical control principles. Uh, and for demos, YouTube videos in this day and age. Uh, animals, as this previous speaker pointed out, are often uncooperative. For those of us who work with animals, that's just part of the game. Hard to control, and they're often too good. This snake, oops, which is not swimming very well across the grass, but you would, you might have seen it go through, scoots across the grass almost effortlessly. And it seems almost like a non-problem if you stared at it long enough. Just uh, Limited capabilities in the organismal world, unlike folks like Aravi who can work on, uh, work on systems where they can exquisitely explore detail after detail. In the organismal world of fish, of snakes, things, the kind of things that I've been interested in, we just don't have good ways to record in bulk muscle on neural activity, 3D kinematics, dynamics, reaction forces, blah, blah, blah. However, there's been kind of, in my opinion, a revolution. And the previous speaker showed some of this. And that in the last 10 years, to make robots has become actually possible for a physicist in a laboratory, uh, which it wasn't the case 15 years ago. If I wanted to study a robot 15 years ago when I started, I had to go to my engineering colleagues and bow down and get a robot. And now, this robot was made by a postdoc in my group, a biology PhD postdoc who came and wanted to learn something about snakes and how to make robot models of snakes. And it took him a little while, but with 3D printing and with increasingly smart, controllable, powerful servo motors and sensors and controllers and microcontrollers, you can make really cool creative devices which begin to model physically certain aspects of the living systems. Um, uh, you can also use these things to discover new, cool, non-biological dynamics, and I'm not going to talk about that. But if you're interested, we have a review paper, and there's a couple more since then. Okay. They've basically become an infestation in my lab. Uh, I get, and George, I'm at Georgia Tech, so we get a lot of great engineering students. Every kid in high school and then who comes to Georgia Tech in the U.S. now builds robots and wants to build robots, and they're just much better than the grad, they're much better than the faculty, certainly uh, better than often the graduate students. And it's all maybe like PCs were 40, 50 years ago. So we have now a whole diversity, a menagerie. We have robots that help us try to understand things about lunar rovers. We have robots that swim in sand, some of which I'll show you. 
some bipedal robots, some robots have a whole program in trying to mimic certain aspects of modern physics, including quantum mechanics and general relativity. Uh, I'm not going to tell you about all these things, but just it's a blast. Uh, my real interest, though, and this is where we begin the meat of the talk, is in comparative principles of organisms moving teradynamically, and largely we focused on dry grinding material. And here's where I want to kind of tell you one of the surprises that we found and, and how it's brought us into a really interesting branch of mathematics, which I barely understand, but hopefully there's people in this audience who are experts and can begin to help us. Uh, the touchstone for this one, the keystone for this one is a little lizard called the sandfish lizard, which we've spent about 12 years now studying. Uh, it's a lizard that does this. It's similar to the one you saw in that previous uh, video of the sidewinder going across the, uh, the, the desert, in the Nana Desert. It buries into the sand in basically a second or two. Um, and uh, when it's on the surface, it essentially walks like a lizard should, using kind of an alternating limbs to propel itself. But when it decides to move into the granular material, to use the fluid-like aspects of the granular material, it does an interesting kind of contortion of its body in concert with limbs to propel itself down into the ground. What's going on? Well, nobody knew until 10 years ago, 12 years ago, we basically hooked up dental x-ray equipment with a high-speed camera attached to the output phosphor of an image intensifier and shoot x-rays. Uh, and these two excellent students, who one is wearing his lead vest to protect him, uh, basically did the first experiments to actually visualize what's going on beneath the granular material. Uh, and here's what it looks like. Here's one of our first videos. This is just a barrier which doesn't descend into the material so that it sort of tricks the animal to diving at that spot. But you see it essentially turns itself into what, at the time we said, kind of looks like an eel. That's an important uh, misstatement, by the way. Uh, but it's in real time, two body lengths a second through the granular material. And it's not just going horizontally. It's going down about 20 or 30 degrees. Oh, sorry. This is a plastic barrier, which basically is right on top of the sand and doesn't descend in. So the animal thinks it's going to run into something and dives more or less repeatedly. This animal is nice because it's pretty stereotyped in what it does, which is the trick to finding good animal models in these systems. OK, it goes in about 20 or 30 grand. These granular materials are interesting. I'm not going to tell you much about granular materials, but basically, as I go deeper in the granular material, the forces increase linearly, unlike in a fluid. Uh, the pressure increases in a fluid, but the force on me doesn't. So it's really tough to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, OK, to get a better sense of what's going on, you can bond little markers to the animal. Um, and here, these are kind of little lead markers, which are easy to fall away. It's just they have bonded to their skin with super glue. And you can see that the animal essentially sends a wave of body undulation, a wave of body curvature, not unlike we saw in a previous talk, down the body from head to tail. And these, it's a little bright in this room, but these little markers are attached to the limbs. And you can sort of see, you know, maybe could we turn off the light, possibly? You can sort of see that the limbs are kind of held to the side, and the animal's essentially hypothesized, essentially, ooh, better, driving its movement using its body insulation, kind of swimming like a fish. It's a sandfish. OK. How do we understand this? Well, here's a slide which summarizes sort of 10 years of work. And Nick Gravish contributed to good chunks of this. We basically mimic the desert. Whoa, that's loud. Sorry. We mimic the desert in the lab by making air fluidized beds, which blow air up through a dry granular material at above a critical flow rate. The granular material becomes a fluid. Turn off the air. It settles into a loosely packed state creating a nice repeatable thing. Let me turn that off. We, of course, from those images, with some sophisticated and increasingly sophisticated tracking, you can extract the midline of the animal as a function of time. And here's a plot which shows from blue to red time increasing. And you see that when the animal is walking on the surface, it's basically a straight back. And when it starts to bury, it starts to wiggle its midline. And then when it's underneath, its midline is basically looking sort of sinuous. And in fact, to a good approximation, every instant in time, the animal essentially is, to an approximation, a single period sine wave, uh, which is traveling head to tail, with an amplitude and a wavelength lambda. Okay? And it turns out that that amplitude to wavelength is always about 0.2, between 0.2 and 0.3. Independent of conditions, particle size, compaction of the material, how deep it goes in the ground. We think it's controlling for this sort of shape. Well, one of the tricks, we haven't had PDEs like we have for 
Navier Stokes. So the next best thing in a granular system is that you basically take a box, a virtual box, you fill it with virtual sand, uh, in this case, three millimeter glass spheres, which you validated the contact interaction, dissipated repulsive contact forces in against laboratory experiment. Nick did a lot of that. Uh, you then make a little virtual sandfish, which is essentially, and this is gonna come up a lot in the, in the talk today, the control model is really stupidly simple. You say, I'm gonna prescribe, there's, you can't see them, but there's sort of 50 virtual motors on this thing. I'm gonna prescribe the angle of successive motors as a function of time to be sinusoidal, and I'm just gonna phase delay them down the body. So I'm gonna end up with a traveling wave from head to tail, okay? And the controller is gonna be really good, so it always maintains that shape. No sensing. Well, sensing in the sense that, 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 that the simulation says, no matter what the force is on me, I'm gonna be able to prescribe my shape, okay? The cool thing about this video is that I've colored particles blue where they're not moving much from instant to instant and more reddish where they are. And what you see is that this thing is sort of swimming in a fluidized granular material, but it's fluidized locally around it. So it's kind of swimming through a puddle of granular fluid. And the forces in this fluid are dominated by friction among grains and friction between particles. And thus we call them frictional fluids. That's the word. Uh, the other important feature of this is if I turned off the motors, virtual motors in this simulation, the robot, the virtual robot stops on a dime, stops almost instantaneously. Not like the eel in the previous slide where there could be some gliding and coasting. Okay, finally, if we want to understand the kind of forces presented to the organism, we have to, didn't have Stokes law, don't have PDEs, so we essentially spent a lot of time taking robot arms, attaching little objects to them, and dragging them in different orientations, directions, and depths through the granular material. You put all that stuff together, and sort of a miracle happens. And the miracle is, you can read it in here, but it's basically taking a very old theory, the first sort of theory of hydrodynamics of small organisms, which we guessed, and I'll explain more in a minute, and porting it to granular materials. The theory is very simple. It's called resistive force theory. You say, I've got a body. I'm going to prescribe a shape as a function of time. Each little element on that shape is going to instantaneously, as it's translated to the material, experience thrust and drag. You decompose that, or going to experience a reaction force. You decompose that into a thrust, which moves this way, and a drag, which moves this way. Uh, you sum up thrust minus drag. You input a shape that you prescribe, and you solve for the velocity of the center of mass of that shape, changing shape, which satisfies force balance at all times, because there's no inertia. Okay, that's the scheme. It turns out it's not a great scheme in, in fluids, because the interaction effects from an element over here and an element over here are strong. In the granular systems, it turns out it's great. Uh, Bottom line is if you do that and then you put in assumptions like a single period traveling sine wave, no inertia, the force always balance, and that the resistive forces linearly superpose, and ask me about that later, you can essentially use this theory to calculate how far the organism should travel as a function of uh, per undulation cycle as some metric as a function of this amplitude to wavelength parameter. And you'll note that the animal is the red points are here, its speed and the range of amplitude and wavelengths it uses the gray lines kind of give you a sense of the spread, and you'll note that the theory basically nails why the animal's moving the way it does. This is the speed. The green is the mechanical cost of transport, how much energy it takes to go a meter, yeah. Uh, I was expecting that uh, the ratio A over lambda is, uh, is almost constant, was a consequence of the next inextensibility of the, of the, of the, of the... That's related to it. Yeah, yeah let me, I can, I can give you a hand wave, a quick hand waving explanation. There, <laughs> it's the competition between increasing thrust as you increase your amplitude and decreasing progress in the world frame. And a DEM, an MD simulation set of videos highlights I think that pretty well. If you're just wiggling with a low amplitude, you don't get much thrusting surface this way. None of your surfaces are particularly pushing well. If you're thrusting, if you have a high amplitude, they're thrusting, pushing quite well. It's just that you're basically spending all your time going up and down in the world frame. It turns out that you can write this quantity as a function of those two things. One goes up, the other goes down, they cross at some point. This is generic, I think, to all sorts of swimmers. Uh, okay. This is for us in this organismal biomechanics world what we call a control template then. A pattern of behavior that we believe the organism is organizing its internal degrees of freedom to target to generate some good 
behavior. Swim fast, escape from us, use low energy, etc. By the way, I just like to highlight this because it turns out that this miracle of granular resistive force theory, which I'll talk a little bit more, is now in some sense been explained by a colleague and collaborator of ours at MIT, a guy named Ken Cameron, who's now shown actually that all these granular, uh, these force relations that we've measured, painstaking over 12 years, all pop out of uh, PDEs, which are frictional plasticity PDEs, hyperbolic PDEs, all very local. And his paper in 2016 basically recapitulates everything we measured to you know, a few percent. Anyway, let, let the theorists have something. Okay, this stuff is good. Let me just quickly show you another little animal just to amuse you. Here's a cool snake that lives in the desert southwest, which we've spent a lot of time studying. If you saw any of our snake diffraction work from this year, this is the same animal. It's a shovel-nosed snake. It does that. I still don't really know how it does that. But you can turn on the x-ray and you can see what it's doing beneath the ground. And lo and behold, it's basically able to swim uh, through. It turns out if you track it well, you'll note that its midline tracks are non-overlapping in the same way the sandfish was. Not quite as, as dramatic, but there's still, what that indicates is there's still always a little bit of slip of the animal. It's not moving in a perfect tube. So we said, well, we'll try RFT again. And here I bring this up just to show you another cool plot. Here's this same displacement body length per cycle, now plotted not as a function of A over lambda, but as a sort of non-dimensional curvature. So as the, this number increases, capital lambda, you'll see this the rest of the talk, going from zero to 10, the body becomes more curvy. And you see a similar story. You go up and you come down, and the snake fits here, and the sandfish sits here. It's pretty good, nails the, uh, nails the kind of curvatures they're using. And there's a whole story about why it, you become long and skinny, which I'm not going to tell you, uh, and what that does for you. Other to say that, that, that this theory didn't work so well until we actually put in a kind of fudge factor was that the skin friction was wrong. Uh, and we had measured the skin friction on grains for this animal. And you put that in the theory, and the theory didn't agree well for this animal. And then we had the idea, well, we should go and measure the skin friction. There was a prediction that the snake has two times lower body grain friction than the sandfish. And inspired by my colleague and friend, Professor Hu, we did the old snake, anesthetized snake sliding on a, on a board filled with grains. And lo and behold, when you measure that, you basically get a factor of two in belly scales. Okay. So the theory is pretty good. We've applied it to robots. Here's a robot, which we won best paper award for at a robot conference about almost eight years ago. It's a multi-segment robot that can swim through granular material. And from x-ray and DEM simulation, you can again see the same phenomenon. You plot body lengths over per cycle as a function of amplitude of wavelength, and there's a peak. And the red is the RFT simulation, agreeing quite well with experiment simulation. OK. Turns out that this frictional fluid picture and resistive force theory just is the gift that keeps giving, whether they be undulating, whether they be sidewinding, <laughs> whether they be moving with limbs, to a good approximation, to a very good approximation, we can model the interaction forces and calculate for a given limb motion how far the animal should displace. For us, that's been a success. But it's kind of a boring success. And this is where the next part of the talk begins. It's a boring success because it's OK, I know f equals ma, and I can solve things. But if I want to figure out how to make a better movement, I have to recalculate everything. And it's laborious. And so how should this thing move its body? Should it be moving? Uh, with a wave which is A over lambda of 0.2, or can I, how do I iterate through parameters? Well, it turns out that the first, touch, the first key to this is we realized is that these animals that we've been studying are not swimming like eels, in the sense that these animals basically inhabit a world where if they stop self-deforming, that's going to be the next language, they stop self-propelling nearly instantly. Unlike the eel, which if it stops self-deforming, will glide for a little bit. And it turns out that that world is much more like the world of tiny organisms, like nematode worms and little spermatozoa, uh, where inertial effects are swamped by viscous forces. In our case, inertial effects are swamped by frictional forces. OK, so that's kind of cool. You can even compare them. You can do RFT, which was done for small organisms. Uh, and you can calculate the same kind of, you can play the same sort of game. And you basically see a kind of similar for a little nematode swimming in fluid versus a sandfish swimming in sand. You see the sandfish seems to go about double the distance uh, 
uh, body lengths per undulation cycle. And it turns out that's because if you look at the resistive forces, here's the perpendicular and parallel resistive forces. And if you're an expert in this world, you'll note that the per perpendicular forces and the granular resistive forces increase more rapidly at low attack angles, which allows the animal to generate more thrust relative to drag. Okay, cool. That's mechanical. Is there another way to visualize the character locomotion? And this comes to our friend, the falling cat, who can do a turn without changing its angular momentum. This tends to puzzle people. It turns out that there is, was, that every, more or less every physicist knows this, a talk by Purcell in the 70s and then a paper, uh, which he basically sort of narrated in a much more elegant way than I just have, this kind of amazing feat, feat facts of the world of the microorganism, such that when Reynolds' numbers get small, our intuition of how to move breaks down completely. We live in a world, if we're swimming for sure out there, if I swim and paddle, I can coast for some distance. The fish flaps its tail, it can coast for some distance. Spermatozoa cannot. Uh, and he basically, to kind of highlight these questions, he came up with what we now call a Purcell swimmer, a three-link swimmer, uh, which basically you prescribe the shape of this thing as a function of time by prescribing the angles of two joints as a function of time. So you're allowed to control theta 1 and theta 2 here, and each of these little elements experiences uh, resistive forces in a fluid. Okay, uh, you all know that if you do a reciprocal motion with something like this, you get nowhere. That's called the scallop theorem. Uh, and it's because of certain symmetries inherent in the Stokes equations. Um, but if you do a non-closed path in a configuration space, in this case, a little square where I hold theta two fixed and I've changed theta one and then I hold theta one fixed and change theta two and then I bring it back to make like a little wave down the body, I can actually get somewhere. And it turns out, and here's where the story gets really interesting, it turns out that, and I know this because I happen to know this guy, who's at University of Kentucky. He was a graduate student at Santa Barbara, and he was the student of Frank Wilczek. And Wilczek heard Purcell's talk. I have this on good authority. Heard Purcell's talk and came back to Al Shapir and said, aha, we can formulate this problem of self-propulsion at low Reynolds number in terms of a gauge field over the space of shapes. And you know, Shapir said he didn't know what that meant. It, seven years later, he did. Uh, they published this paper in PRL. They have a JFM, two JFMs maybe. They have a number of interesting papers. This was the heyday of geometric phase, Barry's phase, in the 80s. And as far as I can tell, in the physics community, it hit like a lead balloon. Because people said, why on earth do you need gauge theory to understand the swimming of something, a tiny microorganisms? It is guns to a knife fight. It is really way too much apparatus. Uh, turns out, though, that a bunch of engineers largely at Caltech, but others around the country, in the US, control theorists found this idea pretty interesting because to them it was a way to think about controlling robots and devices uh, in a different way, a kind of geometric way. And this is what I want to narrate a little bit. And they're the ones who kind of developed this stuff. And I'd say that this guy, who was a student of this guy whom I collaborate with, basically figured out the trick to make this useful for the kind of devices and animals we study. And that's where really the geometric phase dimensionality reduction part of my talk uh, hits. Here's the scheme. It's really simple in principle. It's hard to do in practice. The scheme is this. You have to connect two spaces. One they call the shape manifold, the space of internal degrees of freedom of the swimmer. The other is SE2, let's say. Let's only move in the plane for now. OK? I'm going to apply this to the two degree of freedom per cell swimmer. I have my body shapes meaning every configuration of the Purcell swimmer I could think of. Theta 1 up here, theta 2 down here, theta 2 over here. Here, I keep track of body, center of mass, position, and orientation. OK? The game then of locomotion <laughs> is to figure out how paths in one space lead to paths in the other space. So far, I haven't said anything interesting. There's an onsatz. The key assumption here this is the theorist's assumption, it turns out you have to test this and you can test this, is that body velocities are linearly proportional to joint velocities or shape change velocities, provided things are small enough. And there's a matrix here. It's called the connection. 
because it's related to actually connections and differential geometry. Uh, but it's a connection. Uh, and so it says that if I make a little wiggle with my body, I will translate and rotate by a little amount, linearly. Okay, it's the first thing you would try if you're a physicist, and they did that in their PRL. Uh, fine. Well, the only problem is then what it says is you basically have to go in, and for every configuration of the body, you have to either by analytics or experimentally or empirically, you have to make a little wiggle. So if I start in alpha 1 and alpha 2, which again are configurations of the robot in here, two angles, I have to make a little wiggle. And I have to make then every wiggle. So I have to change theta 1 a little bit and theta, while holding theta 2 constant. I have to do all this whole pre-calculation. But if I do that, I generate something called a connection, my colleagues call these connection vector fields, which are kind of interesting uh, um, uh, machines, I guess, such that I now have a little vector at every point in my configuration space. And basically, if I make a little wiggle, if I go from, if I connect my shapes from here to here, it says, if I tried to make a move that does that, right? I'm into some configuration, I could go anywhere I want to another configuration around here. If I go this way and I align with a vector, that means I'll do well. There's a dot product, so I will, that will get me that. And if I do, if I try to make a shape change which is perpendicular to that local vector, I don't do so well. So then the game is make paths in your configuration space which do the best that you can by going with the flow of the vector field. Okay? <laughs> so you do a line integral. So you say, oh, no, no problem. I just need to now do a line integral over this thing, integrating it up, and off you go. The problem is, what they tell me, is that it's hard to do these kind of line integrals because they're essentially iterative integrals. At every point, you have to, you make a move. Your body has translated and rotated. Now you have to take your coordinate system, which you fixed to the body in the first instant, and you have to rotate that coordinate system and do it again and do it again and do it again. It's kind of like the Euler problem, which we teach in, which I teach in mechanics, right? Nobody likes to solve Euler's equations uh, for rotating and spinning because you have to keep changing your frame of reference. It's a pain in the neck. Um, and if you don't do that, you can't do this line integral because the commutivity aspects of SE2, rotations and translations don't commute. As Michael Berry once told me when he visited the lab, he says, well, if they did, you could do all your turning in the garage before you left the house. And, okay, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> it's a British joke. I can't tell it like Michael Berry. What these guys figured out how to do is something really cool. They said, we're going to turn a line integral into a surface integral. Well, you still have your non-commutivity problem, so you still get hosed if you try to use Stokes' theorem. But there's another way, if you have a Lie bracket term, uh, it turns out, you can and, most importantly, you pick the right coordinate system, you pick the right gauge, where you can minimize the non-commutivity aspects, which kill you. And so what they end up with is basically a new thing called a height function, which is this curl of A plus this Lie bracket term. Uh, they call them height functions. And so now the game is, <laughs> now the game is, you have a new machine here. This is for X displacement. Do a surface integral of this, this is a contour map representation. Here I have a 3D fancy version. Do a surface integral over this thing. And the amount of surface integral I pick up will tell me how much I displace or rotate how much geometric phase I pick up. OK. So here are the insight. And this is what this guy figured out as a PhD, is pick the right gauge. If, and he can prove if you pick the right gauge, and for certain, some organisms are better, some robots are better than others. But if you pick the right coordinate system, you minimize those non-commutivity effects, and you actually can calculate things. Cool. Uh, let me give you, let me walk you through, before I get to the animals, because it really is a cool extension which takes advantage of some work that Greg Stevens has done. Before I get to the animals, let me just walk you through uh, how this works because it's beautiful and it changed how I thought about locomotion. Okay, here I have height functions, x, y, and theta. I need three of them because I have my three coordinates. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw paths, circles in this space. A circle in this space, in the alpha 1, alpha 2 space, just means I've got a sine wave playing on alpha 1 and a cosine wave playing on alpha 2. All right, so everybody by that. <clears throat> if I do a closed, if I do a surface integral over this thing, and I've made plus as red here and minus as black, that convention unfortunately is going to change in the subsequent slides, but just for right now, if I do this surface integral and I have a lot of negative, that means I'll displace. So I do a surface integral on this thing, and you'll note that I get a good amount of x, so I'll go somewhere. I do a surface integral on y, and lo and behold, I've got positive and negative, 
So I go nowhere. And same in theta. I enclose an equal amount of positive and negative surface integral. Okay? That's point one. By the way, I should say that resistive force theory, like I said, the gift that keeps given, these are height functions actually calculated for uh, experimental system with granular material. We did the first, no one had tested this stuff. There were 20 years of mathematics developed on this. No one had tested this stuff. So we built one of our earliest, most primitive robots. Uh, and it's basically two motors. And at that time, we didn't even have 3D printers, so it's wooden blocks. Uh, it's embarrassing to look at now. But we sort of went ahead and said, well, we'll assume that the kind of things that are important for this scheme work in granular material. They're kinematic, no inertia, check. There's a linearity in the local connection. That, that ansatz I told you that body velocities are linearly proportional to shape velocities. We're going to, turns out it's OK. And there's a symmetry in space and time. And that's where we thought would be the killer. It turns out you need symmetries in space and time. The uniform, medium has to be uniform, homogeneous. And you can't have hysteresis effects. Turns out that's a reasonable approximation for the granular systems. We could talk about that later. Here's what the robot looks like. There's little lights that you can see it actually doing its little circle gate. That's what we're going to call these things. And here's some data. So I have forward displacement height function. And I have displacement body lengths per undulation cycle as a function of stroke amplitude. The stroke amplitude is just the radius of this, of this flapping in the parameter space. So if I double the stroke amplitude, that's basically doubling the angular extent excursion of my, of my body. And what it sees is the experimental data is black. The gray is our DEM simulation. And you'll note that the displacement has a kind of characteristic feature, which we even saw actually in the previous talk, despite it having inertia. It kind of goes up quadratically and then falls over, uh, the theoretical prediction that is. Why? Well, suddenly you understand, or at least I understand. If I have a tiny circle and this region is negative sine and it's all roughly the same magnitude, then a tiny circle, and if I double the radius of a tiny circle, I'm enclosing the same still, that magnitude of negative area, but I'm now enclosing four times that, so I increase quadratically in my displacement. And so I go up quadratically until my circle starts to eat into regions of opposite sign, and now my surface integral is picking up positive, negative and positive, and so my displacement starts to go down again. And that's the geometric reason for why you have to pick the right amplitude in the simple swimmer. Um, you then can say, well, I want to optimize. I want to, go, I want to go as far as I can, assuming no constraints on my motor power and energy, battery. I want to go as far as I can for undulation cycle. Well, what should you do? You should do a surface integral over, uh, over a path which only encloses uh, negative area in this case. And that's what you do here. It's called the butterfly gate, or we call it the butterfly gate. And it's absolutely bizarre, and I don't think you ever would have thought of it uh, had you not had these tools. But you could see that in this configuration space, you're basically no longer worrying about your phasing and sequencing of limbs and body. You're basically showing uh, as doing this, doing this path. So it's pretty cool. Uh, and it brings up again this idea. It gives us a way to look for what we'll call templates, ways that the Purcell swimmer should be controlled to move forward well. OK, you can do things like turn in place, which you never could have thought of. You go to the theta height function and close a loop here. And it determines the, the direction you go around the loop comes into the surface integral as well. So you go around the loop clockwise and then counterclockwise in the other sign. And it basically gives you a turn in place without any translation. Pretty powerful. And it compares well to the experimental data. OK. And you can compare, then, locomotion in different environments. Now, that was essentially the long preamble, which I had to explain to get to the real meat of the talk. And here's the real meat of the talk, which is a review. We have one paper in review and another paper, which is about to go out. Can we apply these to higher degrees of freedom systems? Because who cares about the Purcell swimmer except as a physics exercise demonstrating these things? And the answer is yes. And these are the guys who figured it out. We did the tests. Here's a robot, a multi-segment, multi-motor robot. Again, you're now controlling the robot's motors as a function of time, just like my virtual sandfish earlier, where I'm prescribing sinusoidal shape changes in its curvature as a function of time. Um, there's some midline tracks. You see it kind of swims like a sandfish. It's in a bunch of granular material. And by the way, I might refer to these as serpenoid curves. This was a term brought up by a famous roboticist named Hirose, which is basically curves which are sinusoidal in the curvature, not necessarily in the amplitude in real space. Here's what they did, and here's the dimensionality reduction. They say, OK, well, 
This thing has 16 joints, 32 joints. If it's a continuous body, infinite number of joints. Forget all that. Let's just decompose it into two modes, two eigen robots, eigen snakes, eigen worms. And we're just going to twiddle the amplitudes of those modes. And we should be able to recapitulate lots of interesting shapes. Pick a sine, a cosine. Specify the curvature along the body as a function of arc length as W1 times beta 1s, which will be your first mode, and W2 times beta 2s will be your second mode. And if you do that, here's a configuration space now where every position, every, every spot in this configuration space is a W1, W2 multiplication of sines and cosines. And by going in a circle around here, I've made this little animation. You could see I get something that kind of looks sinuous as it moves. So that's the dimensionality reduction. Let's see how well it works. The answer is you can then apply this same machinery now using these modes. You can generate these height functions. Now I've switched my sign convention. Red is plus, uh, black is negative. And I can do this same business. And lo and behold, here's the body length per cycle as a function of this curvature of the thing. Here's the robot experiments. And here's the RFT simulation. And then the area integral, the surface integral. It's pretty close to it. So you can start to do it. And then it gets more interesting, because now you have new elements to kind of operate on to understand how things go. Suppose I want to compare granular swimmers and viscous swimmers. In my previous plot, I showed you plots with lots of force vectors and velocity vectors, which were hard to interpret. Now you just say, oh, well, look, this height function has a bit more red and is a different, slightly different shape. I don't understand it. This is all very new. Uh, and so this is why this thing basically goes faster than the other. If I were to now say, suppose I, in a viscous situation, suppose I were to vary a parameter called the drag anisotropy. How much the, if an object is being pulled through a material, how much it resists going this way versus this way? Well, I can do that and generate height functions. And you'll note that as I increase that parameter, C, which is essentially telling me how hard it is to move perpendicular to my axis direction in parallel, you'll note that if I'm very low C, I have a big black region. And as I get higher and higher, I get a redder region, which gets more and more ellipsoidal. Well, what does that look like? Well, here's what it looks like. If I have a low C, actually, it turns out that that means I have a drag anisotropy less than 1 for the experts. So I can't go anywhere. Or actually, I can go backwards. If I have it as 2, that's my kind of nematode in a fluid. And if I have it as 20, it just takes off. And you'll note that it says that the best way to do is not to make a circle in this space, but to enclose the most surface integral to a kind of weird ellipsoidal thing. OK. Turns out, this is a detail, but an important detail, you can actually do this empirically as well. You could take a robot, and here's a video which will run for a minute, and you can put that robot, if you have a lot of students who are patient, in a particular pose, twiddle it, measure how far it goes with a sensitive camera, put it again in another pose, twiddle it, measure how it goes, and build up this whole connection vector field. And it will play. And they're demonstrating for you how they're going to build it up. And if they spend a lot of time doing this, <laughs> there it is. OK. So it takes a lot of effort. But once you have that, then you can do pretty extraordinary things, like say, here's the theta height function. Here's how I can make my robot turn in place in granular material. All right. Uh, it'd been hard pressed to do that. OK. What about living systems? I'm almost done. Uh, here's our sandfish again. And this is, by the way, the work of Jennifer Rieser, who was a postdoc in my group, who really was the one who put all these pieces together. And there's a paper on the archive right now that you're, you're interested in. What you do now is you follow Greg Stevens and crew, and you track these things. And then you use the relative curvature of segments on the body. You can plot that relative curvature as a function of time, and you see waves of curvature propagating through. You can then do a principal components analysis on it. Uh, and you find that basically the dominant postures of this thing are a sine and cosine mode. And that says that in its configuration space, now made of sines and cosines, it's basically some approximation executing a loop. And there, these are the PCs. Take about 80, 90% of the variance. Okay? Then you can play the same game. You put those modes in. You compute your height function. You do the same procedure, and off you go. The theory overestimates the sandfish swimming speed for reasons which we can talk about later. It basically has to do with kind of assumptions of drag on the head of the animal. It's a longer story, but it basically gets the, gets the curvature that the animal's using. 
And then it becomes rather cool because now you can start to do comparative studies. I can say why or how can I understand why this animal is different or better or similar to another animal. And I can do this same kind of trick, in this case for this snake swimming on the surface, turns out it's also non-inertial, so highly damp. I can basically decompose it into modes which are now one and a half periods of sine and cosine and compute these things. And now here again is the animal data, lots of animal data, lots of sandfish data, snake data, and the theory basically tells you why it's moving the way it does. Okay. And so then the principle becomes, and to me this is rather lovely, is maximize your berry phase. And when Michael Berry visited, he, I think, got a kick out of this. And, you know, for Will Check and these guys, it started as just a simple example of visualizing gauge theory, but for us it's become a tool. I'm not going to bore you with the, yeah, well, I could bore you, but I'm not. It turns out it works for sidewinding too, and it works for a diversity of sidewinders. Basically, sidewinding, we've discovered, is, along with David Hu, is basically two waves playing on the body, one in the horizontal plane and the other in the vertical plane. If you just look at the horizontal plane and decompose it, a la Stevens, you make eigensnakes, uh, you find a circle in this postural dynamic space, you do the height function again, and now <laughs> you do this, and now you go to the literature and you plot every animal that's ever been reported and how well it sidewinds. And what you really measure is people say, well, it sidewinded at this speed and it had track angles it's a weird gate, I'm not going to explain that. Track so you have to go through a whole procedure. But it basically says that the animals that are the champion sidewinders live in the desert, like I saw in that first slide, they're the ones who are optimizing their berries phase. I'm done. We can apply it to legged systems. It turns out that anything without inertia, even granular material, Coulomb friction, this stuff gives you a good first approximation. Here's a little salamander. It's a new kind of height function now on a cylindrical space, S1 cross reels. You can figure out how much displacement you get as a function of the, how you should bend your body relative to how you phase your limbs. The coolest thing we can, oh yeah, we can do it with animals. The coolest thing and the newest thing, and I just had to show you this because it's like hot off the press, is that I've been fascinated with centipedes for a long time but never been able to study them because tracking the motion of animals with this many parts had been impossible. Venki Murthy and others, maybe Aravi's part of this, I don't know, figured out how to do neural network, deep learning. Uh, they have something called Deep Lab Cut. I had an undergrad spend two weeks clicking, training the neural net, two nights of the neural net thinking, and you feed it in videos as a, tre a centipede uh, from the desert southwest of the US running on a little treadmill. It has, I think, 40 some legs, uh, 20, 20 pairs and a bunch of segments, and those blue, which you can barely see, that's the computer which has tracked every element. And the cool thing is then you could say, well, the centipede is a wave of body undulation. You could see a wave going from head to tail. And there's a wave of leg oscillation, which you could sort of see each angle leg. And if you plot those against each other, now you need a toroidal space to compute your height functions. That's a detail. But the and, and the way you calculate the surface integral is a little bit different. I'm not going to bore you with it. But basically, you should be impressed that the blue, the blue points of the experiment, the purple is what would be the optimal way for the animal to phase its limbs as calculated with a connection and a height function based on Coulomb friction now, not even granular material, and it nails it. I'm done. Uh, I could tell you about how changing leg lengths are interesting, but I think I'll quit there and just tell you that Geometric phase dimensionality reduction, living and non-living locomotive systems. One of the big surprises is that many of the organs we study at the macro scale mimic environmental interactions at the micro scale. Frictional versus viscous fluids and Coulomb friction. Dissipation much greater than inertia. Granular RFT provides a good model for thrust and drag and locomotion. Using a low dimensional representation of locomotor postures and a model for the environmental force, we're able to predict displacements resulting from cyclic sequence of shape changes. Good, reasonable, oops, I meant just to say reasonable, good agreement, <laughs> with no consideration of the physiological constraints, muscle power, speed, that's where we're kind of going next. Muscles can't, that butterfly gait that I showed you with the Purcell swimmer is crazy. You have to really jerk your body around. No organism is going to do that. You now want to start to put in models of the physiology, which we, we now have a rational way to do that. Works in at least one system where the two modes don't capture much. That snake you saw swimming underneath the sand looked like it had a horrible shape in the real world. It turns out its curvatures, basically two PCs capture 70% of the variation. Still works pretty well. And works if the environmental physics is not known. Local connection can be determined empirically. 
And then here for me, from the kind of organismal biomechanics and maybe robotics control if I were an engineer, is that this stuff provides a systematic method to discover control templates in frictional fluids and frictional surfaces, and we don't know where else it can go. But I just thought I would tell you a little bit about this stuff, and I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>